We now recognize our first panel, uh, it says of witnesses, I will say of witness. The Honorable Earl Devaney is Chairman of the Recovery and Accountab Accountability and Transparency Board. And to get your title fully, are you still, in fact, an IG on loan to that position? An IG on loan and one of our favorite IGs from his previous work at Interior. Pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in. Mr. Devaney, will you please rise to take the oath? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record indicate Mr. Devaney answered in the affirmative. Chairman, I won't even give you the introduction. You know the drill as well as anyone. You have been here many times. If you go over, no one is going to call the whistle on you uh, because, in fact, we are here to hear what you have to say. With that, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, uh, for those kind remarks, and members of the committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to share with you some of the Recovery Board's lessons learned. I will be glad to answer any questions you have after I finish my opening remarks. Mr. Chairman, I have given considerable thought to lessons learned from what I sincerely hope will be my last government assignment. What I would like to do today is to share with the committee 10 very specific lessons learned that I feel could be incorporated into the way our government does business going forward. The first lesson learned is that nothing motivates bureaucrats to act faster than a law with concrete deadlines. The longstanding culture of Federal agencies has been to take the path of least resistance and to take the longest time allowed to enact any change. I have found that agencies continually underestimate their capacities to get things done, pursuing pilot after pilot with few long-lasting developments. In fact, there are so many ongoing pilots that I sometimes think of our government as a giant airline. The Recovery Act addresses this problem head-on, requiring recipients to report the use of recovery funds within 180 days of enactment. This suggests to me that any new law imposing requirements on agencies should include firm and certain deadlines for implementation. Second, that spending data can be collected directly from recipients with a high degree of accuracy. In the past, data entry about Federal spending was done solely by agency employees. The Recovery Act and its mandated recipient reporting changed that dynamic, proving that recipients of Federal funding could report just as accurately. Any future legislation should recognize this potential cost savings and call for the migration of all spending reporting from agencies to recipients. The third lesson learned is that this spending data can be quickly quality controlled, displayed and uniquely arrayed to achieve unprecedented levels of transparency. In the past, agencies in receipt of recipient reported data would have spent ex excessive amounts of time scrubbing that data in the basements of buildings all over this town prior to releasing it. By the time of its release, the information would be outdated and meaningless. The Recovery Act required real-time reporting with results made public within 30 days, four times a year. And in the end, the data was not merely published as a jumble of numbers in a hardbound catalog that sits on a shelf somewhere, but was arrayed geospatially on recovery.gov, making data available and understandable for all users. The fourth lesson is that the Federal Government desperately needs a uniform government-wide alphanumeric numbering system for all awards. Currently, each agency uses its own unique numbering system for contracts and grants. As we found during the recovery transparency process, these disparate award numbers make tracking Federal spending unnecessarily arduous and complicated. Every quarter there are mismatches when we try to align recipient reported award numbers on federalreporting.gov to what the agencies had reported to OMB in our efforts to see who did and who did not report as required. The award ID numbering process must be simplified and standardized, perhaps akin to the credit card numbering system that we are all accustomed to. Fifth lesson is that new technology, particularly cloud computing, can play a critical role in the delivery and effectiveness of transparency and accountability. In April of 2010, the Board made the move to a cloud computing infrastructure for recovery.gov, a groundbreaking event that allowed for more efficient computer operations and reduced cost. Cloud computing is a pay-as-you-go approach to information technology, permitting lower initial investments to start operations. 
It is also flexible enough to allow IT staff to add or subtract computing capacity as needs dictate. In an era of routing out redundancies and inefficiencies, this condensing of systems could create an enormous savings for the American taxpayer. The sixth lesson learned is that transparency can cause embarrassment, which in turn causes self-correcting behavior. In February 2010, we began publishing on recovery.gov a list of noncompliers, a list of shame, if you will. That states the names of recipients who have failed to report as required. Users can see who the repeat offenders are. I am happy to report that in the first quarter of 2011, the number of two-time non-reporters is down to 17, and the number of three-time non-reporters is down to seven. This is out of over 200,000 awards reported for the quarter. But perhaps the most important lesson learned is that transparency is a force multiplier that drives accountability. It has become abundantly clear to me that transparency is a friend of the enforcer and the enemy of the fraudster. With, less, with more than 80 percent of the recovery monies having been awarded, less than half a percent of all reported recovery contracts, grants and loans currently have open investigations. After nearly two and a half year, years, there have been only 144 convictions involving a little over $1.9 million. I am often asked why, the, why there has been so little fraud. I have little empirical evidence to prove it, but I believe that it is largely due to the transparency embedded in the Recovery Act. Number eight is that the goal, if the goal of, is prevention instead of merely detection, agencies and IGs both have a high degree of incentive to collaborate together. The Board's strategy was to focus our efforts heavily on preventing fraud from occurring in the first place, not just detecting it after the fact. That is why the IG community has provided training for more than 130,000 people since February of 2009. My observation has been that when, fraud, when the goal is fraud detection, IGs come to the table with a great deal of enthusiasm while agencies seem less motivated. In overseeing these recovery funds, the Board has learned that when the common goal is fraud prevention, agencies and IGs are equally enthusiastic and a remarkable collaborative effort takes place between the two. The ninth lesson learned is that the most valuable accountability module is one that provides equal access to both agencies and enforcers. The new analytical tools and methodologies developed in our Recovery Operations Center have proven to be as valuable to the agencies as they have been to the IGs. I believe that a single repository for this accountability data, rather than many recovery-like centers sprinkled around the Federal Government, would be a better idea and present a significant cost savings to the American taxpayer. Finally, there is the lesson that articulating success for prevention is a lot harder to do than for detection. Forty-one years ago, I began my Federal career as a Secret Service agent, learning how to protect our Nation's leaders. How do you measure success in that role? Certainly, failure is easy to, enough to see, but how does one measure the real effect on a potential assassin that the Secret Service presence has? Now, towards the end of my government career, I admit I am still pondering the difficulties of measuring successes of preventing fraud or waste. How can we know how much fraud has been prevented by what the Board and the IG community did during the recovery program? High fraud losses accompanied by front page stories and nightly news segments would have clearly signaled failure. But we may be left to wonder, as many of my former colleagues in the Secret Service do every day, about what success really looks like. All I can say is for sure is that to date, in a government spending program of more than $800 billion, we have witnessed extremely low levels of fraud. Mr. Chairman, I have recently written a white paper reflecting the Board's successes and some of the lessons learned I have talked about here today. More importantly, this paper also lays out a template for how these lessons could possibly be embedded in the government's business practices going forward. I plan to put that paper up on recovery.gov today, and this concludes my oral remarks, and I will now be glad to answer any questions you have. 